Well, thank you, everybody, for coming out to my show. I've been scrambling all day to get this ready, and it's going to be great. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, I had a very strange year. A very strange year. A weird thing happened to me. I uh, got a prosthetic leg this year. Um, people who know me know that I've been a runner for 35 years, and I've had some of those people say, is it hard to run with a prosthetic leg? And I say, well, it's certainly harder to run with a prosthetic leg, but luckily the one I got is very light, and uh, <laughs> if I tuck it under my arm like this, <laughs> it, I, I can run with it, but, but it's not, I don't know why I would, I really don't. So, well, somebody's trying to steal it. You know. Yeah, so we'll, we'll put that right there. So this is Ron Morse. I've known Ron for 30 years. He's one of the best guitar players in Fresno. And I had the check in the mail for that. For yes. Same thing. And, and we have actually never played music together. Not only that, but he also does not know any of the songs that we're playing today. He hasn't heard any of this show, and he knows nothing about it. So, um, you're probably wondering, well, why are you telling us this? So, here's kind of what's going on, right? I mean, I start out with kind of, kind of a weak side gag joke, I know. And then I introduce one of the greatest guitar players in Fresno and say, but what is our expectation there, really? I mean, he doesn't know what's going on. It may be great, it may not. I'm expecting it to be great, trust me. But we don't know. Anyway, so um, if you're wondering, it's because uh, one of the things I found to ways to be successful in life is I like to lower the expectations <laughs> at the start. So I have, uh, I've just found that to be a successful uh, way to get through life. Um, I've had seven re substantial or reasonably substantial romantic relationships in my life with uh, strong, intelligent, independent women. And I know, this guy's thinking, really, you? Uh, seven? <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, one of the ways I've been able to do that is by keeping the expectations low. <laughs> uh, it's, it's worked for me. So, uh, so I have been with my wife, Tracy, for 27 years. She's here yeah. today, thank you. Um, 27 years. And uh, this year I bought her an Apple Watch for Christmas. That's a nice gift. She really enjoyed that. She liked that a lot. Um, but the very first year we were together, we started going out in February. In December, I had to get her a Christmas present, right? So I bought her a fire extinguisher. <laughs> because I wanted, to, I wanted to say, I care. I care deeply about your safety. Yes. I also wanted to say, and you're probably not going to get exactly what you want from me in life, but I'm an extremely practical guy, and it might be worth hanging out with me for a while. So, so that has worked out pretty well so far. And I'm still writing love songs about her, and she wasn't expecting that either. So this is uh, the one I wrote this year, Steps and Sync. Wow. 
It's Rogue Festival, day one, for me, so. It looks like the bar's open, too, right? Excellent. All right. So one day I wake up, and I think, hey, I need a prosthetic leg. So I go on eBay. Three minutes later, literally, this is true. All my stories today are, are sadly true. Um, so uh, I go on eBay, and uh, uh, three minutes later, 57 choices. I pick one. Two days later, it's at my house. I think, mean, what a strange world it is we live in. <laughs> you know, I've been around a long time now, and I never thought we'd live in a world like that. But I'm, I'm certainly enjoying it. So, um, another very weird thing that happened to me uh, a long time ago was uh, back in 1983, I was living in Tucson with my first wife. My first wife's name was Julie. And uh, I was working in an ornamental iron shop down in the south end of Tucson a little ornamental iron shop. I was working as a welder and one day the boss comes in and he says, hey, I need you to drive all the way to the north end of town or go up to the north end of town and pick up this car I've had sitting out in the middle of the desert for 18 months and drive it back. I said, okay, you know, I'm just, just a guy working. I just do what I'm asked. And so I said, uh, so he says, yeah. So we're gonna have, I'm gonna have Fred take you up there. Now Fred was our bookkeeper. And uh, he did the accounting, and he answered the phones, and he, he uh, made the appointments. And he drank coffee all day long out of a, one of those glass coffee mugs that, uh, by the time I got there, it was translucent brown. I don't know if it had ever been washed. And he smoked more cigarettes. You know, this is back in the days when you could just smoke in your office, right? Anybody remember those days? And uh, he smoked more cigarettes. Anybody remember those? They were 120 millimeters long. They were. Uh, a little skinny and they had brown paper on them and the ash would get really long. That was the weird thing about it. My grandmother smoked them while we were playing Yahtzee. And you'd be sitting there and you'd be watching, you know, and she'd be, she'd have the ash and you'd think, wait, the ash is that long and you're watching that and then she'd put it down in the ashtray and it'd get like that long and pretty soon you're not paying any attention to the game, you're just watching the cigarette ash. And she was probably cheating, you know, while we were doing that. It's probably a scheme, I don't know. Anyway, so, says, uh, Need you to go up to the north end of town with Fred. Oh, the other thing about Fred is he only had one leg. He only had one leg. And it was, it was cut from above the knee because he, he had a strange hinge that went reverse. So it looked like his knee went backwards, but I'm sure, that, I never saw his leg, but I'm sure it was fake because his knee went backwards. And he would walk like this. And, and it would kind of go down and then it'd bounce him back up. And he, he could get around, he could get around pretty well. 
So I thought, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to go, and he drove a little Fiat X19. I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. I'll be interested in seeing how this car tricked out so we can do this. So we get in the car. You know, I get in. I buckle up. He gets in, fits his leg, lifts it in the car, right? And uh, lights up a cigarette, lights up one of his more cigarettes, and he says, uh, and I look over, and I think, oh, that's... That's a five-speed manual transmission right there. <laughs> this is going to be interesting. I want to see. He must have something on his hands or something to control how this is going to happen. Um, so he picks up his leg, and he shoves down on the clutch pedal, puts it in reverse, and we back up. And he's got his cigarette, and the ash is oh, about that long at this point. And then picks up his leg again, shoves it down on the clutch, puts it in first gear, and we go tearing off out of this gravel parking lot, throwing gravel up in the air, and this guy starts driving like a maniac all through Tucson onto the freeway, and literally it's like this. Wah! 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 <laughs> and I'm torn between watching this cigarette ash get longer and longer, and just being terrified because I realize that there's a large portion of time that nobody is steering the car. <laughs> so I've calculated it, right? And I figure it's about 3%, 3% of the time, I'm saying, well, 3% of the time not steering a car, that's not too bad, but I figured this out. If you were to drive from Fresno to Tucson, 3% of the time not steering would be trying to steer, not steer from Kingsburg to Visalia. <laughs> So, as a songwriter, I know, I know. So, as a songwriter, I try to, I try to give myself challenges. So, I thought, let me try to write a song from a perspective of a one-legged man. Goes 
So I had a weird thing happen to me this year. I had an ultrasound done on my testicles. <laughs> that was it was the, the weird it was the, close to the weird probably one of the weirdest things that ever happened to me this year. So uh, what happened was uh, I was having pain in my testicles, and after a couple weeks, when it wasn't going away, I thought I better go to the doctor and I better get this checked out. So I go to my doctor. My doctor checks it out, and she says, "I don't see anything." And I said, well, I just wanted to come in and get checked out because my father had testicular cancer when he was 50, and he didn't get checked out, and he let it go too long, and he ended up losing one of his testicles. He had it surgically removed, and he also had radiation therapy because he had testicular cancer. She goes, huh, 50. And uh, I said, yeah, 50. That was as far as that conversation went. And then she says, well, I'm going to send you down to radiology. So I went down to radiology. And they say, well, we're going to do an ultrasound. So an ultrasound is, uh, the, if you I don't know, how many people have had ultrasounds? That was my first one. So a lot of people have had ultrasounds, right? But I go down there, they, ta they take this wet gel, and they squirt it all over the area, and a warm gel, which I, I thought was very considerate <laughs> and, probably, and probably helpful on their part. Um, and uh, and uh, they take the probe, and they go all around everywhere, right, for 11 minutes, 11 minutes. Now, I don't like to be touched, generally. I especially don't like to be touched by strangers, um, especially not for 11 minutes. I can't ever remember a time when I was touched for 11 minutes by somebody that was a stranger. Um, but we got through it, and uh, I, we had a good conversation. I was able to ask her about her job and her training and all this, because 11 minutes is a long time to be sitting there with somebody <laughs> doing an ultrasound on your testicles. Let me trust me. Um, and I so... Uh, I said, well, what do you do? She said, well, mostly 90% of my job is, is pregnant women. I said, well, this, this breaks up your day pretty good. <laughs> and, uh, so I, thought, I was thinking about this because I have a picture of my dad and my mom and my first wife, Julie, and me in Tombstone, Arizona. And my dad looks uncomfortable. He always looked uncomfortable in pictures. But he looks uncomfortable because it was, I remember it was right after he had had his surgery and his cancer treatment. And that just freaked him out. Um, it freaked him out. Now... He ended up living another 32 lives, uh, 32 years with just one testicle. He didn't have any problems, it was fine. But I'm a guy, my motto is, I think you can check this on Facebook, my motto is if you don't have a backup plan, you don't have a plan, right? <laughs> so I know that I can live with only one testicle, but I'm the kind of guy, I come to this show, there's my spare guitar. I like Ron, because he brought a spare guitar too. So if I got testicles, I know I can live with one, but I want that, I want that spare. So that's why I went to the doctor. And um, where was I? I was talking, oh, I was talking about my first wife in this picture. So I'm looking at this picture and I'm thinking, man, I haven't seen my first wife for 33 years. And um, the last time I saw her, uh, we, had, we had a good little two-year practice marriage. It was good. We parted pretty easy company. Uh, she even kept my last name after we got divorced. So it was, it was pretty smooth. And uh, it just wasn't right. And so anyway, um, she sent me a letter a couple years after we get divorced, and she says, my brother, who I'd become very close to, Mark, uh, had a terrible accident in the desert, and he rolled a, G uh, a tractor over on himself, and it crushed his foot, and one of the levers on the tractor actually uh, uh, went down and, and uh, tore through his groin, and he almost, yeah, so this guy's like, oh, that sounds bad. Um, <laughs> He almost bled to death in the desert, and he ended up losing a foot right about there, and he ended up losing a testicle. Yeah, that was terrible. Yeah. Where am I going with this story? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, I got to come up. Yeah, I got to come up with one-legged man stories. That's the only other one I know. So anyway, he, was, he didn't have one leg when I went to see him. He was doing fine. Last I heard, he was doing fine. When I saw Julie, it was a little bit awkward. We had been apart like two years. We really didn't have much to say to each other. 
Uh, maybe it was just too soon to reconnect on that kind of way people do. But anyway, uh, this is a song kind of about that relationship. It's called Chocolate and Love. No, no. 
just two things left I need, I need love Thank you, thank you very much. So, uh, Ron's doing a great job. Yeah. Doing the job, the job that he was brought here to do. But I thought, why not give him an opportunity to do my job as well, so that I could take a break. You know, he's basically working for half the show. So, um, so uh, Ron's going to uh, uh, do a song for us. So uh, let me let him have the stage for a minute. Well, I, I think I might talk a bit because, you know, Normally when I'm playing guitar, I, I have my bass player and a drummer and a guitar player. I have like a, a backup so that if people start like coming at me with clubs, you know. And, uh, <laughs> so Victor said, well, you know, you can talk a little bit about music and that. So I got my first guitar when I was eight years old. I mowed lawns all summer for the $13.50, tax included, that it cost from the thrifty drugstore. That guitar was worth maybe 50 cents total, and that's being generous. Within a year, it started coming apart. My dad and I had to start gluing it back together, which started with my messing with guitars, I think, because it was out of necessity. The next year on my ninth birthday, my grandmother was kind enough because she was a kind lady, very kind lady, to see that I was struggling playing a guitar with steel strings with an action five miles above the fretboard and bought me a nicer guitar that was better. And I played that. And then in junior high, I ran into this character who I thought was going to be here today, but he's not, so I can't make a pick on him. Named Blake Jones. <laughs> you can still pick on him. Yeah. 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 We know who you're talking about. And uh, I can't... Oh yeah, I remember it was going to be a church talent show, and I wanted to get some guys together to mime to uh, 409 by the Beach Boys. But no, 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 we're going to actually play. Now mind you, I had all these guitar lessons, and I still really sucked. Okay? <laughs> My mom had been spending money, bless her. Anyway, mm -hmm. so we put the uh, band together, and we did Johnny Be Good. I remember we played at a church talent show, and I remember a lady telling me that I was going to go to hell. <laughs> Now, considering that Blake was in the key of A and Rob, the bass player, was in A flat, and we were playing Johnny Be Good, if she would have said, "You're going to go to hell for what you did to Johnny Be Good," you know, she might have had an argument. There. But, you know, in being a snarky teenager, uh, I told her, "Well, that's none of your business." And all that, so my mom didn't like this lady. Anyway, so. But that got me started in playing in bands over the years, and through music. I have gotten to see the United States and Canada, along with four other guys crammed in a Dodge Tradesman van. And you know nothing smells worse than a Dodge Tradesman van that's had five guys who can't shower regularly for six weeks in the summer going across the country. I, had, I got to play, I got to go overseas, thanks to music and Blake Jones, to play the cavern. You know, no, I didn't meet any Beatles, but I did get to meet the younger brother, Pete Best, the guy who got kicked out of the Beatles. So that's it, you know. And most importantly, I've gotten to play with some of the finest musicians I've ever heard. And more importantly than that, I get to call them friend. And that's really important. And it's something I can share with my son, who I'm not going to point out here today, so I won't embarrass him, but you know. He's over there. Okay, what's <laughs> <laughs> did it, not me, okay? You can't get mad. <laughs> He's a little kick on the player, by the way. Anyway. But this has been just something, you know, a, a wonderful thing over the years to get to play music. With P and with people like Victor, when Victor asked me, I'm like, sure, I'll do this, because this is, you know, it's, there's no net, you know. <laughs> 
So there's also yeah. no rehearsal. No, <laughs> net, no rehearsal, nothing. It's like uh, you know, it's sort of well, let's see what we can do here. And like he says, it does lower expectations. <laughs> so anyway, I'm gonna do a little thing. I, I, I uh, do a little uh, thing here. I will. Big jazzy blues thing we call it. <laughs> Jumping with Ronnie. <laughs> called the Bare Naked Ladies and they have a song called If I Had a Million Dollars and when they play that on stage people throw Kraft Dinner which we call Kraft American Macaroni and Cheese we call it Macaroni and Cheese and they throw that up on stage so the last song I did Chocolate and Love I had been thinking I need a song to get people to throw stuff on stage but I don't really like Kraft Dinner so just saying <laughs> just saying you know I play around town pretty regularly so bring chocolate, bring chocolate. yeah bring chocolate and throw it at hmm? do a song about broccoli <laughs> no <laughs> asparagus maybe but not broccoli so uh, I had another weird thing I, I did a weird thing this year, something I hadn't done for a long time. I wrote a letter. I wrote a, a letter, um, put it in an envelope, put a stamp on it, took it to the post office, and mailed it. Yeah. I, have, I haven't written a person as a means of communication. It wasn't like to answer a, the government or something. It was a means of communication. I was trying to communicate with an ex-girlfriend. Um, and it was the only way I knew how, because what happened was my mother died this year. My mother died in November. She was 83. She lived a long, good life. She had a pretty easy going out. Um, but I was at her house, and there was a Christmas card from the previous year from, from a, uh, a woman that, that had been a friend of my parents. And my parents had introduced me to her uh, back after I got divorced from my first wife. And we had gone out for a few months. We had a good relationship. Uh, but she's remained a friend of my parents for like 30 years. And I saw this uh, Chris, or Christmas card, and I had been following them every year. So I, I had kept in touch and knew what, what was going on. I hadn't kept in touch with her, but I knew I'd kept track of what she'd been doing, and I thought, well, I better, I better write to her and tell her what's, what's going on. And she, she ended up coming out to, to my mom's funeral, which was very nice, and I was, I was uh, surprised at um, how glad I was to see her, because I'm not a very sentimental person. Um, but it was really touching to just see her and to reconnect after 30 years. It's one of the weird things about living a long, long time is you live a long time, and you know you can go 30 years and 
It's like, oh, I still remember you. When you're only 30 years old, you think, I'm not going to remember anybody in 30 years. But you do. So I, uh, it was just really nice to see her and, uh, and uh, reconnect. And she reconnected with my family. And, uh, and so my mom, my mom was a very, a very interesting woman. She was kind of cold and distant. Um, and uh, pretty rigid, right? Would you say? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, and uh, she liked things a very certain way. And most of the time, she just wanted to be left alone. Why she had four kids if she wanted to be left alone, <laughs> I could never figure out. Um, but I always got a lot, I just really respected that. And I, under I understood that. And I thought, I get where you're coming from, lady. And I always got along really, really well with her. Uh, so, when I look back at, at all these relationships that I've had, I, I, I thought, oh, I've been lucky. But I thought, it's probably not luck. I mean, seven is probably not luck. It's probably, I've been fortunate to be able to make seven good choices. But I thought part of it was probably, it came from my good relationship with my mother and understanding women. I don't know if I understand women, but I understand if you just leave them alone and let them be what they want to be, um, that you get along a lot better with them. So, so my mom had that tinnitus uh, her whole life, and the radio was on constantly in our house from the time I was I can remember. It's radio, if if she wasn't watching TV, the radio was on constantly. And uh, once we got to be teenagers, we're like, oh, you're not going to be listening to Frank Sinatra anymore. And we got her onto the rock and roll station. And then we just actually took the knob off the radio and said, that's where we're staying. And she became a huge rock and roll fan. She loved uh, the Who. And Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, she loved them. Um, I need to pick up my clipboard here because she kept listening to rock and roll. She would listen to the K Fog in San Francisco for 25 years. The last list of music she asked me to download for her and put to CD in um, back in April of last year was uh, I want Audio Slave Like a Stone. Can you get Automatic from Mondo Cosmo? Uh, Come Down From This Cloud by Bush, Black by Pearl Jam, and Good Life by One Republic. That's a little poppy, but um, all in all, that's what my mom wanted to listen to. Uh, and her favorite song, she had a favorite song, and her favorite song was, um, my sister made a CD for one, uh, there were six versions of, oh good, we're still good, doing good on time, six versions of one song. Um, and she had the, the original artist did a radio-friendly version and then a non-radio-friendly version with not one, not two, but three F-bombs in it. And that was the one that she had on the CD that played next to her bed in her hospice room as she was slowly d leaving this world. And I thought, see, that's why I always like... My mom also had a very good sense of humor. And, and she would have found that very, very funny. I mean... Yeah. So we're going to play this song, and I would invite you all to us, uh, and we're going to do the radio-friendly version, because this is a PG show. But I would invite you all to sing along if you know it, or to sing along if you don't know it. I don't, I don't care.
I'm not around It's so very special I wish I was special But I'm a in the audience who'd like to give a shout out for their show. I see a lot of folks I know. I stand up and I just do it. Um, uh, Jaguar and Heather, Save Your Marriage, Comedy Show, Bitty 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 Tonight, 9.15, and rest of the week. Woo! Woo! The back in the leather jacket. Uh, the fraud that can make it a bitty. Yay! Uh, yeah, some garage, 60s jangle pop, so that's about to it. Woo! Woo! Uh, Josh Lager. Uh, Brian, Songs and Stories, across the <laughs> 